1996, we, our company was the first company to remove Sierra Leone cocoa from the blacklisted cocoa because of quality. So we did a lot of quality. We generate our own electricity, source our own water, okay. and then we treat the water so that it can be usable for our different products. Boom! What's up guys? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Joannis or Joe Hatagua. I'm a Sierra Leonean American living here in West Africa. And if you want to know how the largest cocoa export company was built in Sierra Leone, then this is the video for you. Okay, cool. So today we're meeting up with Hamza and Hamza is going to talk us through the business of Capital Foods. Now, Capital Foods is a multi-layer business. And in fact, the entire division and Capital Group has a number of different businesses associated with it. So you have Capital Foods, which includes cocoa export, and they export a lot of cocoa to the Netherlands. And then you also have the juice company. So if you guys are in Sierra Leone, you're familiar with Sierra Juice, the juice company where they bottle up mango juice and orange juice and different juices. Then they also have the water company. So the Sierra Water, it's probably one of the more popular water companies in Sierra Leone. So that's under the Capital Foods Group. Beyond that, they're, they're doing puffs, they're doing cocoa powder. They also have a Nutella-like cocoa spread that they're doing. So the, the Capital Foods umbrella is really extensive. So we're going to talk about that. He also has the Sierra Palms Hotel. So the Sierra Palms Hotel is a hotel that I've stayed in. I've done a tour of. You can check that out in my channel. I'll put that in the description below. He also has the Sierra Palms Hotel, which is based on Lonely Beach Road. And then lastly, they have a security company, which they also manage as well. So the security company works for private institutions. And if you are a commercial institution, you need security the capital group has all of these businesses under their umbrella. The origin story is really interesting. Hamza takes us through it all. So check it out. All right, what's up, guys? Well, I'm here with the CEO of Capital Foods, Hamza Hashim. Uh, Hamza, thank you for doing this. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate this. Uh, I think Lisa from Nali Spa connected us, I interviewed them before. So make sure you guys check out that interview. Nali Spa, that was a really good interview, great conversation. And she said, I need to talk to the person who is overseeing Capital Foods and the Sierra uh, Water and all the other products that Sierra has here. Sierra is like the, the water company that I buy all the time when I'm here. So it's actually good to see the factory, which we'll get a tour of, and to meet the people behind it. So before we get into the business of Capital Foods and all the subsidiaries underneath, I, I'd love to ask you about your background, where you're from, the upbringing, and, and what brought you to Sierra Leone. So thank you, Joe, and of course, thank you, Lisa, for having uh, you to us. So my name is Hamza Hachim. I'm currently the CEO of Capital Foods. My family came from Lebanon. We actually migrated to Sierra Leone more than 100 years ago. Wow. I am a third generation Sierra Leonean, born in Sierra Leone, and was raised in Sierra Leone, with the exception for the period of my education. I went to the American University in Beirut. And once I graduated, I returned here and started doing this business. Nice, nice. Okay. So what did you study? In? I studied computer science and okay. I had a minor in business administration. So your minor is what you ended up actually yes. focusing on as your career. Okay. And so what, what led you to Sierra? Were you, did you work your way up or were you in other businesses and then came over here as a CEO? How did this actually occur? So I joined the family business in 2005. Okay. And we were doing mainly the export of cocoa and coffee. Okay. So we used to buy the uh, raw beans of cocoa and dry them and then export them. So, and we did not used to do value addition. So throughout uh, my early engagement with the family business, I started thinking why we are not doing um, extra addition to cocoa. Right. And that started a whole you know, research, thinking about what are the possibilities. And so the cocoa business is seasonal, yep. right? Mm -hmm. And I also noticed that we only work like for six months in a year, and then there's another six months that we don't do anything. And we have this team, we have this infrastructure, uh, with the trucks, with the network of farmers, I started thinking, how can we benefit from all of this together? And so I started thinking that we can add actually some other uh, crops 
And that's how we started thinking about different things. And we started, we thought that the, the place to start with was uh, foods. And we started with pineapple and mango fruit. And then we established the first food processing plant. I used to travel a lot between Tiananmen and Sydney. Okay. And on the way to Freetown, there is a village on the road called Tiananmen. Right. This village always, uh, there are kids, they know the street vendors on the road. They, they flush you with pineapples, on, filled with baskets with, filled with pineapples, and they send you the 10 pineapples for 10,000. Right. When you get to Freetown, they are selling the one pineapple for 10,000, even 15,000. Right. And this broke off, you know, a big bunch of questions. Why is this happening? Where is this inefficiency in the market system? And we went into a lot of research and we found that because there are a lot of uh, cold storage in Freetown, there is no cold chain network that allow the fruits to move to Freetown and preserve their ripeness and in their conditions for consumers to consume. So that pushed me to start to think that how can we process the pineapple so that we can preserve it longer. And that's how the juice came in. So we established the first factory to process fruits to uh, juices, but bottled juices ready for consumers to consume and drink. And this opened the whole Sarah later on you know, with a new product that later on you. So this is how the whole thing started. Wow, okay. I was, I was going to ask you the origin story, but uh, and, and maybe we take a step back too. So how did the family start the cocoa business? So I, I, I saw how we got from cocoa to juices and, and now some of the other products, but how did you start with the cocoa business? What was the origin story there? So as most of the Lebanese migrating families, when they came to Sarajevo, they were initially doing trade, import, and sales, right. and most of them also were engaged in land trading. Right. So in the early 1990s, my family started to think about diversifying and they started exporting cocoa. And actually, uh, as part of a partnership they were part of in 1996, we, our company was the first company to remove Sierra Leone cocoa from the blacklisted cocoa because of quality. So we did a lot of quality. And so that's how the story started and continued until 1997 when the coup took place and then we had to halt all operations. Sure. In 2002, when my father returned to the country uh, because of the war, we had to leave a bit. I traveled, tried to do business in other African countries, but then once it was same year, we returned in 2002, started again in the cocoa business, and uh, that's how a bit by bit we grew the business. And so when I joined in 2005, we exported seven containers. Okay. And around 2015, we were exporting something around 200. Wow. Okay. So obviously, you scaled the business quite a bit. When did you take over as CEO? So I CEO in 2014. Okay, 2014. So you helped kind of scale that to the next level, you would say. Okay, and you mentioned diversifying the interest and in, uh, getting into other businesses. So went from the diamond business to the cocoa business, cocoa business to fruits and juices. Uh, and now obviously there's a display of many different products here. Can you give me a bit about the origin story of how you came across the ideas for water and some of the other products that you have here? So once we got the bottling line for the juices, we had this extra capacity and there was a, a lack of supply of pure bottled uh, water in the Syrians. So we decided to, and we already had the water filtration system, we decided to introduce Syrian using the same machines that were uh, bottling the juice. Later on, as we the, the demand for the juice increased, we had to invest in a separate line that does the water bottle. So this is how the water came in. And so, although initially we were doing cocoa, we still were not adding value to cocoa in terms of processing. Now, we were the first company to increase value of cocoa by getting a clean certification. We got the wood certification, and then we were the first major exporter to get organic certification. And we led to the whole change of Sierra Leonean cocoa market into organic. And so now 100% of Sierra Leonean beans are exported as organic because of the initiative we took in 2012. So we were getting this extra price for the cocoa because of the certification status. However, there was no processing. So in 2016, there was the Sierra Leone Agribusiness Development Fund, which we applied. And the idea that we, it was a competition, and we applied for 
finance to establish a local high court. And part of that fund, that grant went into the uh, factory and lost the match funding from our company. And that's how we invested in processing the cocoa into what is called a cocoa mass. The cocoa mass is sort of a semi finished product that is later on used to process chocolate. So, having done the cocoa mass part, we started thinking, okay, why don't we do some finished product which the local market and the regional market can benefit from? And that's how we created the, the chocolate spread and we created the cocoa powder. Got it. So, you do everything from basically the, the farming, you that's outsourced, right? So it's you get it from the farm. So it's almost vertical integration, but starting at the factory and you all the way to the So same with the farm because yeah. you know one of the things we take huge pride in is our outdoor uh, support scheme. Okay. And we've been uh, partnering with a lot of outdoors and doing something called block farming okay. model, which is basically we provide them with all the inputs, we provide them with all the training. And we partner with them on the plots, and so we become the partner of the local communities in producing the food. So we actually are starting from the farming till the distribution. So my understanding was just Sierra Water and Juices, right? When we spoke, you mentioned Capital Foods and Capital Group. So I'd love to talk about the, the umbrella company and then all of the businesses underneath. Can we walk through the different uh, businesses that are under the Capital Foods Group umbrella? So the group name is Capital Limited. Capital. It's a holding company and owns the shares, the family owned in different businesses. The first business is Capital Foods and this deals with everything that has to do with agriculture, agri-processing and consumer uh, products that goes Food consumer products to the market. The second company is Protex Security, and this is one of the major security companies, Mind Garden companies in Sierra Leone. And we're doing uh, prime locations, prime telecommunication, the port, um, even the private residences and companies. We do the Mind Garden services for them. The third thing we invested in is Sierra Farms Hotel. Uh, and so we do some tourism, actually, started with Capital Hotel in Panama. And then the block into Sarah Farms Resort in Freetown. And now we have a new project under Sarah Farms, which is a new resort in Tokyo. So this is basically the scope of our holding uh, company. Got it. So food, security, and hotels and hospitality. Got it. Okay, so back to the foods. I know that there are many different brands under um, the Capital Foods umbrella. So can we go through each of the different brands that you have? So, of course, we start with the Sierra Water and the Sierra Juice. Right. And on the Sierra Juice, we have multiple flavors. The second thing we're doing now is the chocolate spread. We're also doing the chocolate powder, cocoa butter, cocoa mass for export. And we're doing a puff snack. And we also, part of our uh, vertical integration upstream is we're manufacturing our own packaging with the Got it. So, so this is what we cover right now. Okay, so all of this is packaged here yourselves. Yeah, I'm especially with the juice, the juice packaging. Okay, the juice packaging. And so you mentioned the cocoa powder, you mentioned the puffs, uh, and then is this is this the spread? Cocoa smile, this is the spread. Okay. So kind of like in the stage where we used to like Nutella, right. maybe like a Nutella. Okay. Uh, these are more like uh, Cheetos. Cheetos. Kind of reminds me of like Cheetos. Okay, and then the cocoa powder, is this like for hot chocolate? Yeah. Okay. It's like the Cadbury. Yeah, or in the U.S. we have sometimes Nestle or Hershey's, Hershey's chocolate. Okay, okay. So, so, so this one is the plain cocoa powder, so okay. you add milk and sugar to your own taste. We are planning to produce a new one, which is already mixed, so just add water. Okay. And, you know, cocoa. Nice, it's quite a diversified line. And so all of this is manufactured here in this factory? Right. So in, in this factory where we are now, we're doing the water and we're doing the juices. Okay. And we also have the pop snack, okay. the chocolate. And also juices in Panama as well. Okay. But all of this manufactured in Sierra Leone. Right. Okay, all in Sierra Leone. I'd love to talk to you a little bit about just business in general in Sierra Leone. One of the questions I get a ton from people is what are some of the challenges starting a business and building a business in Sierra Leone? Specific to Sierra Leone, I know there's some market conditions out there that we have challenges with, but you know, people who are moving here, a lot of times they ask about this, especially the Americans that are getting their citizenship, you know, 100 people just got their citizenship. I met with 
about 15 of them, every single one of them asked me about the challenges building a business here. What should they be looking out for? So do you have any, any thoughts on what some of the, the major challenges might be starting a business and building a business here? Definitely. You know, the majority of life has been shed on the challenges. Yeah. Um, but to start from, if you see a company growing locally and doing all this diversification within the different lines of product, it means there is a huge opportunity. Right. So having stated that, of course, there are huge challenges in concerns. Exactly. And one of the things that you picked up, you said we are well vertically integrated yes. from upstream to downstream. And this is you have this is not by choice, it's by default. Yes. If you want to succeed in Sierra Leone, you have to know that you have to tender the most of the infrastructure that you need to, to survive. So yes. we generate our own electricity, we uh, source our own water, treat the water so that it can be usable for our different products. We are manufacturing our packaging so that we can reduce the cost of importation. So when we started, we had to, to provide our own energy, we had to provide our own water. Now the government has made huge strides towards providing electricity. Um, so we have more stable electricity than when we started a few years ago, 10 years ago with the factory. We now 80 to 90 percent of our electricity is actually from the national grid, oh. which is a huge improvement. But you need to have that backup so always ready for you. The second thing is sometimes, as you witness this couple of days, you get some scarcity of fuel, you get some scarcity of cash. So you have to have your own meditation plan for these kind of things. And those, although rare, you know, but they happen. And so you, you're Risk mitigation plan should include instances like this one. And this is the difference between succeeding in Serena and ancient failure. Because if you're not well prepared for times when things happen like this, right. the other thing that I would always recommend is that always try to base your business on raw material degree processing or raw material that is grown locally. Right. Let's say anything between 50 to 80 percent of your raw material source locally. Right. Or grown locally. Yeah. Otherwise, this, it will be skewed towards importation and then you are at the risk of delays because of the logistics issues now, especially after COVID and the Ukraine Russia war. Right. And cost, right? Yes. If you're, if you're sourcing externally, it's the cost channel too. 100%. Yeah. One of the biggest challenges that I always take into consideration is human resources. Mm. Because historically, the education system has been affected by the war and the post-war era. So come with a training system, come with a mentality of developing human resources. It will be very difficult to satisfy all the human resources needs at the beginning. But what I've noticed is that we have the talent locally that needs to be cultivated. But you have to put that extra effort and once you get there. You know, when we started our factory, it was totally run by expat, the one in Canada. Okay. Today it's 100% run by civilians. But it took us like three years to get to this point. Sure. So you have to come with that mindset as well. And you have to accept that you will have to absorb the cost of the expert for the first few years. I see. And then gradually migrate into the local talents and local employment. So this is some of the challenges. I love the idea of having contingencies, risk mitigation. That was something that hasn't come up in the advice that others have given, especially in a, a capital intensive and overhead intensive business such as yours. Um, I see a number of people walking around. There's a number of different people around here. And so, so you mentioned having your own water supply, having your own electricity. How are you doing your own electricity? Is it generators? How, is this all generators? Or, okay. Yeah. So it has been all generators till now. Now we are exploring renewable energy. Okay. The thing about uh, using generators, especially when we started, we were a nascent company. Yeah. You have to look at your capex. Sure. And so always the capex for having renewable energy is too high then versus the lower capex. Right. But when you have limited capital, and this is one of the main challenges that any business will face is uh, your right. access to finance. Right. If your access to finance is limited, then you might end up you know, making choices that are in line with the lower capex, even if at the cost of the higher opex. Okay. And now, if investor, investors are coming from outside, and we 
have enough capital to establish here, it might be easier for them to make those choices where they go with the higher capex and lower opex in the long run. Sure. We did not have that at the beginning. Today, there are a lot of investors coming, honestly, investors like institutions coming to say, you know, willing to invest, which were not there when we started. So now it's a bit easier for the world investors to come to invest in Sierra Leone. Very well put. For all of us who, who not do business as a minor or major, CapEx, CapEx and OPEX, can you do a quick definition of the two? CapEx is capital investment, and that's basically all the upfront money you're going to put into investing in building and machinery, fixed assets. Yeah. And OPEX is the monthly and the overhead cost that you will incur from running right. those uh, assets and running your business, like salaries, like the diesel, the consumables you use in the production process. Yeah. So capital expenditures and operational expenditures, right? right? Um, all of that is going to be the investment you put in as cash output, which has to go into your revenue to look at your profit, right? right. Okay, excellent. Is there anything that I missed, anything I didn't ask you that you um, wanted to cover or, or talk to the folks about? But because of the war that Sierra Leone faced, a lot of investors shied from Sierra Leone and went to neighboring countries. Right. Today, after 22 years from the war, I think we have proved that it's a very safe environment for investors. So there are a lot of opportunities to seize. In fact, when I go out in the, in the town and the markets, I see 1,000 opportunities every day. Right. We have been heavily dependent on importation. And there are a lot of things that we can manufacture locally, more efficiently, and in better prices and make a lot of money. Now, as a company, that's why we kept diversifying and investing in different funds. But the opportunities I see out there is much more than a my capability. Right. If I'm gonna leave you with one advice, I would say that there are tons of opportunities in Sierra Leone. You just need to come and pick one of them, concentrate on it, and then definitely you will have a bigger opportunity making money than neighboring countries because the competition is much less. That's a huge point. Starting from the ground floor, so there are, there are more challenges to start a business. The infrastructure is not there, but that also means that you have no competition. So I think that that's that, that's a, there's a there's a pluses and minuses to that. One last thing before before we ask about where they can find all the products. You mentioned one of the grants that you got where you matched with your own funding and then also investors. Can we talk a little bit about that? So some of the folks who are looking to come to Sierra Leone are looking to invest their own funding, but they're also looking for outside investors as well. For the grant, what kind of things did you have to have in place to ensure that you qualify for the grant and that you are confident enough that you could apply for it and, and expect to win that? In order to qualify for a grant, you have to have a properly run business. Sure. And what does that mean? It means you have to have acceptable accounting system, acceptable human resources policy, acceptable policies in general right. when it comes to human rights, it comes to uh, sexual harassment, it comes to environment protection, it comes to you have to have those policies in house. And so you also need to have your audited statements because when you apply to all of those funds or to those grants, you have to show that you have done your own. Right. So in order to qualify to those grants, you should not be a green field project. You have to have done the initial steps. Now, there are a lot of funds available in Sierra Leone. A lot of investors are looking into Sierra Leone. But always you have to have done the initial work. You, know, you, you do your homework. Establish your concept. So if you don't, you come in to start with your own fund, start with it, then you will have a lot of access. Now, there are plenty of grants in Sierra Leone because of the condition of the market, so offered by different international uh, development partners. Um, we, we got access to African Enterprise Challenge Fund okay. and then Sierra Leone Agri Business Development Fund and Compete Saloon, which was offered by the FCDO and under the umbrella of Invest Saloon. We also uh, recently got an EU grant. So these are the kind of things. And I think now we're looking more into institutional investment. Sure. So we're working with coordinated traders who finance the increase of capacity of our food processing line. We're also working with them on also increasing the capacity of the juice, uh, juice production now and new pack introducing new packaging. Yeah. So, Eventually, as you succeed more and more, you will get more opportunities 
to get finance and low cost finance. Very, very helpful. I, I know people are going to love that. All that information was really helpful. You're looking at institutional investors as well. And I think that that's something that we hear a lot about in Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa, and Kenya. Not so much here. Um, so I'm interested to hear how that process goes. We'll definitely follow up and see how those guys have been investing here in the country. Where can people find your products today? So in Sierra Leone, the products are available all over the market. We have a very wide network of distribution. We're using a whole scope of trucks, vans, tricycles to deliver our product to the last corner in Freetown and in the provinces. So we're selling directly to the kiosk. We do have big distributors as well, okay. but we, we also act as a distributor ourselves because we don't want to be 100% reliant on external partners. If we deliver to the smallest kiosk at the end of the city, we deliver it to them and make sure that they deliver. Now we also find it very difficult to maintain this network, sure. but I think it's one of the major requirements for you to survive in such a market. Basically, you can be found everywhere, supermarkets, yeah. kiosks, everywhere. everywhere. Okay, and then online, you have an online presence, right? We do have an online presence for marketing, not for sales. So we've not right. done any e-commerce. So, so at least so people can see with the product line and all of that. Are you on social media as well? So what, what is, do you know what the name is on Instagram? So Sierra Juice. Sierra Juice on Instagram. Yeah. I imagine it's the same on Facebook. Facebook, it's Capital Foods SL. We are also on TikTok. Okay. I'm also, Sierra Juice. I have my personal page on TikTok where sure. I do some advices to the young entrepreneurs. Okay. Sierra. Awesome. So, you can check everything out there. It'll be in the description below. Hamza, I want to thank you again for doing this. I learned a lot in this conversation. I know everyone out there will learn a lot, I'm not only about business, but of course about uh, Capital Foods as well. So, thanks again. And thanks, guys, for watching. If you found this interesting, share this with anybody you know who's looking to come to Sierra Leone. Or is it this hard business here? Make sure you hit that thumbs up so we know that you like it. Hit us with any comments. If there's anything that I missed, I forgot to ask any questions, or if you have any questions for Hamza, put that in the comments below. Now, make sure you subscribe. Hit that subscribe button and hit that notification bell so you're notified every time a new video comes out. Thanks, guys. See you guys later. And that was the interview with Hamza of Capital Group. What did you guys think? Any questions that you think I missed? Anything you wish you knew about this business? It's an incredible business really long story. He got a lot of funding, external funding, which I thought was interesting. And so just overall, it's a great business. So if you have any questions or are interested, let us know in the comments below. We'll make sure we can ask those questions. If you want to reach out to Hamza, his information is below as well. Check out their social media, reach out to Hamza. On the next video, I'm going to take you on a tour of the plant. So make sure you stay tuned for the tour. We get a chance to see the bottling process, where they make the puffs, and then all of the exporting of the cocoa, you'll get a chance to see what that process looks like. They're actually loading a truck to be shipped that same day when I went to go visit them. So make sure you stay tuned for the next video where you'll get a chance to see that vlog. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I'll see you all in the next video. All right, guys, if you like this video, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, like, comment, and share it with your friends. All right, see you on the next video.